welcome one and all after our Zuri hack hiatus for those of you who participated. I hope you had a great event for those of you who didn't participate. I hope you weren't too impatient while we didn't have Haskellers talks. Um, today, I'm very happy to welcome once again our returning speaker, Ilian, for um, her talk on hardware control using Haskell, um, which is a very refreshing topic because I think it's among the things you don't usually hear Haskell programmers talk about, how to control hardware with it. Usually there's more category theory and less things that move. So um, <laughs> I'm very happy to welcome her back and invite you all to give it up for Ilya. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me here again. Um, so if you have uh, questions during the talk, I will be happy to answer them at the end. Um, there will be some time for uh, questions and discussion. Uh, as Kazim already said, I will talk today about um, controlling hardware, especially uh, controlling input and output devices using Haskell. Typically, these programs are written in language, low level languages uh, such as C, and, um, but this mixes different abstraction levels. So for example, you are controlling in the same program hardware, uh, input and outputs, and you also control um, the sequence of the program, what should happen and everything. And it will be nice to use Haskell for this purpose. Um, you as you already know, I hope uh, Haskell makes it possible to write elegant code, code and um, it helps to reduce runtime errors. So um, this semester I was looking for different approaches to control uh, such devices using Haskell and I uh, had a look at the Arduino and the approach which uses embedded DSLs to control um, this uh, input and output uh, pins. And also I had a look at the Raspberry Pi where I found three approaches to control the GPIO pins. And at the end I will show you an artwork. I already showed you the last time. Um, I uh, replaced uh, software with uh, the controlling program with a Haskell program and now I um, implemented a connection to the hard work of the robotic artwork. So let's start with embedded DSLs. <coughs> um, uh, a domain specific language is a computer language that is designed for a specific program and um, it uses terms and syntax that are close to this problem domain. So one example would be VHDL, uh, Circuit Hardware Description Language, um, which uh, allows you to uh, design circuits. And it also uses terms for this circuit design problem domain. There are two types of DSL. One is uh, external DSL, uh, such as VHDL. It's a language created from scratch. And to uh, process it, you have to write a complete parser. There are also embedded DSLs that are languages that are embedded in a host language. Um, they can use a subset of the features such as appearance and semantics of the host language. There are also two types. Uh, one is the shallow EDSL. This is uh, really close to the host language and it uses elements and the runtime environment of the host language. Um, so the syntax and the semantics are close to those of the host language. And there are deep EDSLs where you use the host language to generate a new language. So you're still programming in the host language, but the output is not Ex an executable, the output is a structure or a language which represents the calculations or actions that should be pro proceeded. Um, if you want to execute it, you have to write an interpretation um, 
which must be explicitly defined. Um, and it's also possible to use uh, um, deep embedded EDS, uh, DSLs to cross-compile your language. We will see that later. So first uh, example of a shallow EDSL. Um, here I defined the integer type for the Arduino called aint. And when I want to do an addition with it, I can use the plus operator of Haskell. Because I'm in a shallow EDSL, so I can use the environment and the elements of Haskell. And I can calculate directly um, my result. In a deep EDSL, it looks a bit different. I have this expression type with uh, two constructors, valint and add expression expression, which is a recursive call of uh, this a recursive type. Uh, so I can um, define my addition with this structure that you see here. So I cannot calculate it now. It's just a structure with which defines how this addition should be done. If I want to um, evaluate it, I need a new function which e evaluates this um, value types to integer and add, adds up my uh, integers. And I can also interpret this structure in another language. So um, a library that I found that uses this EDSL approach for um, programming the Arduino is Haskino. It uses both of the advantages of the shallow and the deep EDSL. And we will have a look at it, how it, what, how, what it looks like. So first, uh, if you don't know the Arduino, this is an Arduino and you see here the GPIO pins. Um, GPIO pins are a um, powerful uh, feature which allows uh, the Arduino or the Raspberry Pi to interact with external components such as LEDs, sensors, buttons, and so on. And as a programmer, you can set these pins as inputs or outputs in your program, and you can manipulate the state of the pin. So for example, an LED would be an output, and you can set the voltage level when you set, uh, set it high, the LED goes on, and when you set it low, then the LED turns off. And then in the Arduino language, which is a variant of C++, um, your program will look like this. You have a setup and a loop function, which is called by the Arduino environment. And uh, setup will be called at the beginning, so you can use it to initialize your pins. For example, I set an LED which is built into an output so that I can use the LED to blink. Then this loop function is called in the main loop and um, is then executed again and again at each iteration. And I used it for this um, LED to blink. So I set with digital write the LED state to high and then to low and in between I wait one second. Now in Haskino, it works similar. So there is this um, shallow EDSL where you can write your program. And Haskino has two types, um, two systems, two variants of the system. One is the interpreted interactive system and the other is a compiled system. <coughs> the uh, interpreted interactive system only can be executed when you have your Arduino plugged into the computer. Um, you can write your uh, program in the shallow EDSL and then you load a firmware interpreter which is an Arduino program provided by Haskino onto your Arduino and then you can execute your shadow, shallow EDSL in the Haskell environment. Then Haskell will send commands one by another to the Arduino where the firmware interpreter will call the corresponding uh, Arduino commands. Um, here are the example program with the LED. 
it's similar to the Arduino program. First, I set the pin mode, and then I have this infinite loop where I um, turn the LED on and off. At the execution, it looks like this. You see here the built-in LED which blinks. And here you can see the, um, the log script of the Haskell code running. Um, you see here the sending of the write pin command, which is false and true. And in between, the delay millisecond um, command is sent, and then Haskino waits until a response comes back one second later. But now it will be good to run the code without this connection to the Arduino, and therefore you have the compat system. It uh, uses, you're still uh, programming in the shallow EDSL, which is close to uh, Haskell, and then this uh, shallow EDSL is compiled into C code. And there is a resulting file which you can load on your Arduino and then run it together with a runtime that is provided by Haskino. So you write your program in Haskell, then it's uh, translated into the deep EDSL, then into C, and then you can load your file on the Arduino. We will look now at the the, this uh, steps. So first the shallow EDSL is the same as before and then it is translated into the deep EDSL and you see it's still valid Haskell code but it's now um, this ex expression language and um, but it's similar to the shallow EDSL. So you see the set of the pin mode with the 13 and output you see the iteration, which is the infinite loop, and then you see the commands uh, digital write and delay millisecond. Um, this code is then translated into C, and um, there is always the same C code structure, so the, um, this C file is similar to the Arduino file with the setup function, this setup function will be called by the Arduino environment and will create a task, um, Haskino main, and starts this task. Um, this is done by the Haskino runtime, which also provides you uh, threading. And um, in the Haskino main function, the program is inserted that you saw before in the deep EDS cell. And, um, you already know the deep EDSL, and this is then translated into C code. Um, <clears throat> you see first the pin mode is set, which is the Arduino function, then this while infinite loop is executed, and then digital write is called, which is also an um, Arduino function, and delay milliseconds reschedules the task by one second, which is uh, from the Haskino runtime, and um, in this way, Haskino makes it possible to program Haskell, but at the end run it on your Arduino. And um, I uh, wanted to see the advantages of pro programming with Haskell. So I um, tried to combine Haskino with FRP, uh, Functional Reactive Programming, maybe you remember from the last talk. I used uh, Yampa to program this, which is a functional programming framework in Haskell, um, which is used for uh, UIs and uh, robotics. Um, maybe a small recap about functional reactive programming. So it's a declarative approach to program reactive applications. It makes the code more modular and by separating the description of what the program should do uh, from the instructions to the output. And this is done using a concept named signal. So your program is, um, or what the program should do is represented by a signal. For example, here you see um, a signal integer 
it contains a value that changes over time. So for example, for an LED, um, you can um, display it as a signal of Boolean, which is true or false, depending on if the LED should be turned on or off. And to switch between the different values, there are events, for example, mouse clicks. And when an event is generated, then it generates also a value containing information about the event. For example, the mouse position of the mouse when it clicks. So for the LED, we would have a function named toggle, which switches the uh, signal between on or off, or between false and true. So first it would be off, and then after a second uh, event happens and the value is turned true, and the LED is turned on. And after that uh, event changes the signal again to false, the LED is turned off, and then on and off again. And on here, the, you, here you can separate the instruction for the LED, turn it on or off, from the LED state. So in Yampa, you would use a function named reactimate to execute this uh, toggle function. And um, you can define here inputs, but we don't need them here. And you can define where the output should go. So the output is this LED state, and we pass it to output, which we'll call digital write with the corresponding value or the current value of the signal. So a reactimate is called in the main loop again and again, and it will turn the LED on or off depending on the current state. So I tried this uh, in, with the shallow EDSL, um, which worked because it's a shallow EDSL, so I can use Haskell and I can use all the uh, libraries from Haskell. But with deep EDSL, it obviously didn't work because it was not implemented. And you have to um, extend the deep EDSL with the libraries or functions that you want to use. And you have to add an interpretation how it should be uh, translated into C. I found a library that does this. Uh, it's called FRP Arduino, and it compiles an FRP program from Haskell to C. And um, it uses its own language. So here, um, clock is a, a signal that increases a value over time, and toggle will turn an, a bit, set a bit or to one or zero, depending on if clock, the value in clock is um, <clears throat> is even or odd. And then the corresponding value will be passed to the pin 13 and set there. So it's possible to use FRP also on an Arduino, but, um, and it has many advantages, ob obviously, but if you use a shallow EDSL, um, you, have, you have to use the connection, but it's easy to use and it runs in the Haskell environment. And if you use a deep EDSL, you need more effort, and, um, but the code will run directly on your Arduino. Um, also, both libraries, FRP Arduino and uh, Haskino, uh, do, do not control the hardware directly, and they can only be used for the Arduino. So if you're looking for a more general and direct approach, uh, there's the compiling to categories, uh, approach by Connell Elliott, um, where, which is more channel or general and will work for anything. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's now look at the Raspberry Pi. Um, I found there are three approaches um, how to control GPIO pins and different libraries. So the first is the GPIO SysFS interface, which is used by the Has Haskell library GPIO. 
it's a simple approach, but it's deprecated, so you should not use it anymore. Uh, but I will show you uh, anyway. Um, it's a pseudo file system of uh, the Linux kernel, and um, there the GPIO pins are represented as files. And um, you can control the GPIO pins by writing into these files. So the Has Haskell library GPIO does this with using the IO monad of Haskell. And so for um, accessing a GPIO pin here, 17, um, you write 17 into the export file, and then, you, then the, the files are created for this GPIO pin. And then you can set it as an input or output by writing input or in or out into the direction file. And then you can start changing the state of the LED by writing zero or one to the value file. And at the end, you close the GPO pin by writing 17 into unexport, uh, which will um, uh, remove the files. So it's simple to use but it's not efficient and therefore it was replaced with the GPIO character device interface. So a better approach is the Python library GPIO zero. It, um, as I said, a Python library, it has simple commands and you can control the GPIO pins without uh, low level programming. For example, there are pre-built objects um, for components like LEDs, button, or buzzers, which you can use. And uh, I connected then this library with Haskell uh, by using sockets. Um, <clears throat> a socket. A socket can be built um, with the network library of Haskell. Um, I have here an example. Um, first, run TCP client will create the socket, and then this blink code will be called. And it's a recursive function which will uh, let an LED blink five times. So um, first, the function resolves the address, and then it uses bracket to open uh, the socket. Bracket is a function of the exception, exception module, um, which allows you to acquire and close resources in a clean way. So first, um, it opens the socket, and then it lets you run your code. Here, my Blink example, and at the end, it will uh, close the socket again. And if an error occurs, it will also close the socket and cleanly uh, release the resource. So here it opens the socket, then it executes the blink example, and then it closes the socket. And the blink code looks similar to the code seen before but I'm sending now my commands over the socket um, with send all. And thread delay is a function of the concurrency extension, um, which allows you to um, reschedule your task by one second. And the new line character is for splitting the messages at the Python server. So at, on the side of the Python server, I initialize also as a socket connection, and, or, and then I wait for the, the Haskell to accept the connection, and then I can handle um, the requests. Um, in the infinite loop, I'm receiving the data from the socket, and then I can execute the corresponding um, commands. And you can see here um, the the clean, uh, the simple interface of GPIO zero. It uses this LED um, pre-built up, this pre-built LED object, and then you can initialize it and set it as output automatically with uh, this LED um, 
instantiation, and then you can simply turn it on or off. So it's much more simpler than writing in these files and handling everything by ourselves. The advantage of this socket connection is that the services are decoupled. So I have my Haskell program, which defines what should happen, and then I can change the server with another hardware when I'm using another device. And GPIO0 is a simple library, so it's a simple interface and helps you to, um, to use these objects in a clean way. But uh, building of a network is an additional overhead, and it's error prone, so it's not good for the performance. So a better method is to call the functions directly by importing them using the foregen function interface. The, Python, uh, the Haskell library HPy does this, and it calls the functions from the library VCM2835. Um, this is a C library, and it allows you to access the GPIO pins. Originally, the ones on the, Bro the Bro Brocom VCM2835 chip, but it also allows you to um, uh, control the GPIO pins on the newer versions of the chip and the newer versions of the Raspberry Pi. The Foregen function interface is a powerful um, uh, feature of Haskell, which allows you the interaction with uh, libraries written in languages like C or C++. The import of such a function uh, looks like this. Uh, it's from the library HPy. Um, and here the function gpio-write is imported from the header file bcm2835. And then you can define a new name, uh, C write pin, for example, and you can define the type of this function. And here, CU char is the wrapper around the C unsight char type. Um, this C call function is also deprecated. Um, it's called, it has now a new name, but um, HPy was not updated since then, so it still uses the old. Uh, name of the function. Um, <clears throat> in a program of HPy, you first have to call the function with GPIO. And this function calls the C function init of the uh, library, and it prepares the file descriptors to the um, to the directory def, to the file def mem. Uh, which is the mirror of the main memory in the Linux kernel. And it will, um, the library will then set uh, bits in the GPIO section of this file. Um, so then you also call the set pin function to set the pin as an output. And then you can call write pin as before which is here the GPIO write uh, function of B BCM2835. And thread delay is also from the concurrency module. So we, had, we have seen the sysfs interface, which is simple but outdated. Uh, we saw the BCM2835 library, which has a good performance and allows you to fine grain control of the GPIO pins, um, but it also needs a more profound understanding of what you do. And uh, GPIO zero has a high level interface and is better suited for beginners. The socket connection helps you to build a modular application, but introduces network overhead. And the functional fragment interface um, brings better performance, but is limited to only a few programming languages. Um, these libraries, uh, Haskell libraries, HPy and GPIO, are were not updated in over three years. So if you're using them, you maybe have to update them before the usage. Now, 
now I also introduced, um, I introduced you last time this um, artwork, robotic artwork by Porson Rao, which I'm redesigning with Haskell. So it's called the Pygmies artwork. Um, it's a sound sensitive installation, which is um, a panel on the wall with these little creatures which are peeking over the edge. And if it's quiet in the room, and then if the people in the room make sounds or noises, the these creatures will be scared and hide. And um, the problem was that this artwork is programmed in a low level imperative style in C code or in Python code. And um, the implementation of the behavior of these creatures is strongly coupled with the control of the actuators and uh, sensors. So the code is complex and hard to write and understand and maintain, and especially for someone with, um, without a programming background as an artist, for example. And last semester, I used uh, functional reactive programming to redesign this software, the control software of these uh, pygmies. And um, I used uh, func uh, the framework Yampa, as I showed you before. And the result was a simulation of the artwork. And this semester, I connected the code with the hardware. Um, the architecture of the simulation looks like this. So f you have the keyboard where you can imitate the sound with zero is no sound and two is a loud sound. And then you have this pygmy signal function, which produces a position and defines where the pygmy should be. So if a loud sound occurs, the position will decrease to zero. If no sound occurs, the position will be increased and the pygmies will look out over the edge. And then there was a UI library which displayed these pygmies and this UI library got this position and draw the pygmy again and again. So it's moving out and then creating an animation of the pygmy moving out. <clears throat> the artwork uses a Python framework called Pathos. Um, it has this sound from the microphone as input and uh, controls the actuators of the pygmies. And it has this um, function pathos behavior, which is called in the main loop. And um, you, the, the program was defined there in a state machine style and then called again and again and the pigments were moved out or back. And then I have here my Haskell code from last semester with this reactimate function of Yampa, which executes the pygmy uh, function and put sounds input in and, ex as a, and uses the position to the out and gives the position to the output. So all I had to do was to build a socket between um, Python and Haskell and I um, passed the microphone's input to the reactimate function which um, created this sound signal. And then it sends the, diff the resulting positions back to Pathos. And Pathos is then gets the position and moves the actuators to the current position. So if it's um, a fast movement, it will go faster there because the position is increased faster. And if it's a slow mo move, it will go slower there because it's a slower increase of the position. And to, to check, uh, to test my code, the artist provided me uh, art, uh, an artwork. It's not the Pygmy's artwork, but it's a variation of it. It's called Lone Pygmy. In Lone Pygmy, there are four Pygmy's, one at each side of the panel and only one pygmy crawls out at a time. 
and the site is then changed randomly when the pygmy comes back. So it um, creates the impression that there is only one pygmy behind the panel and looking out. I have now a, a demo, a video of the current uh, state of the code. And you saw when a small, with a small noise, the pygmy is only going to peaking state, state depending on the pygmy. Some of them will hide completely directly because they're more scared. And with a uh, loud noise, every pygmy will hide. And it was also possible for me to test the pygmy's code with the artwork because I had four pygmies. On the real artwork, there are more than four pygmies, of course. But here's the version with all pygmies. The real artwork is looking a bit better <laughs> than my implementation because I had not so much time to, to search the right parameters for this movement. But uh, I think I showed that it's possible to use uh, Haskell with this artwork. So um, the modular structure by FRP was a help by replacing the, GUI, uh, the UI with the hardware. Um, because I only had to, to change the outputs and the inputs, I didn't have to change the pygmies code. And now the same code can be connected to both the artwork and the um, hardware. So it's also possible to test something with the UI before using it on the hardware. Um, and because this position signal is the same for uh, the UI and the hardware, it's really nice because it should behave the same. Um, also, the extension with this new variant, the lone pygmy, was easy because uh, I only had to do a few adaptions. Um, so what I did was uh, instead of having four pygmy functions for all positions, I had only one, and the other positions were zero, and I simply had to swap between zero and the current pygmy value, and so I only had to introduce a random signal that changes the side. Um, what's still not so good is the code. <laughs> it's still hard to understand for beginners, Especially, uh, Yamba uses a concept named Arrow, which is a generalization of monads, and it's hard to understand for beginners. And the code needs an abstraction for beginners that it's much more easier to program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it have a custom language? Is the language just used for setting up the Arduino? Or, and then you can call random Haskell functions? Or do you also have to write code for your function in this 
custom language to the um, You have to write the code in this custom language. So it's um, with a shallow EDSL, you will call, you, you will, will be able to call everything, but in this, this it's a deep EDSL, so it's uh, you only can use these functions that they provide. And then they have, uh, they will compile your code into C code, and you can only use functions that uh, are able, that they can compile to C code. But you you will be able to uh, extend it, for example, to extend the library. So in this sense, it's not really, it's not a different from Haskino. No. no. It's uh, it's like Haskino, but it only supports. Um, Functional reactive programming. So how different is FRP Arduino mm -hmm. from Yasa? Because now you're uh, able to reuse the code, right? But if you had to rewrite it, would that have been a lot of effort, or? So if it's a big effort to use uh, FRP Arduino for my example, um, I would say yes. Yampa offers much more, um, much more. Um, functionality, but it doesn't offer, as, as far as I know, this direct uh, calls uh, to the GPIO pins. So I would have to find a way to use, so that the artwork runs on the Raspberry Pi, so I would have to find a way, a, a C library, for example, to, or Python would also go. Um, so I would have to write my FRP code and then uh, translate it into Python code so I can call my Python uh, code directly of the artwork. And I think this would be a big effort because I have to think about everything that I need and then I would have to create a deep EDSL which um, offers all this functionality and it would also be not possible to use more libraries or if I use them I had to enable it. So I think it's it's a less effort to use the socket connection but um, if you need a better performance then I think you will have to do something with deep EDSL. Uh, so the question was if it's uh, much effort or what my investigations are about why I used um, a socket connection instead of directly control the hardware. And um, for me, it was a really easy approach to use the sockets because I have Pathos, which is handling this hardware and is working uh, good. And as an artist, with, uh, the problem was that the code is too hard to program for non-programmers. And they will be not in contact with this Pathos code because they don't care about um, which microphone or how to, which type of microphone is used. Um, so it, it was much easier to just replace the behavior part with uh, Haskell. And then socket connection was easier. But it would be also an approach to redesign the whole Pathos framework. I think it would be possible, but it would take much more time. So it would be not suited for the task, or it would not be possible to do it for me in this uh, context of this uh, project. It would be possible. I think these embedded DSLs would be a good approach. Also another pro approach, for example, this one from uh, Connell Elliott, but I don't, um, I didn't take took much time. I didn't invest much time to to look at it, but it would be a more general approach. So I think it would be possible, but uh, I ha I need more time for this. So the question was if the FRP Arduino library can handle analog signals. Uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> I used um, with Haskino. I used uh, analog signals. I connected the microphone and interpreted this and used threads to, to handle this, and, uh, but I didn't look at FRP Arduino, this clear. But I think it should be possible.
but I don't know if they, uh, but it, maybe they have to implement it or it's imp already implemented. So the question was um, w if the arrow concept is really hard, um, really, really hard to understand for uh, beginners. So the arrow concept implements this, is, is used for the signal functions, which uh, in Yampa, the signals don't exist directly and you cannot access them directly. And um, I think that the hard part to understand for beginners is that you, for example, you, you take a sig signal function, you take the input value, then you can use this arrow do notation and you can um, extract the value, change it and, and then you give it back to the signal function at the end. And I think this concept is maybe hard to, I think this concept is hard to understand for beginners that you cannot use the value outside of the signal functions, uh, you don't have access to it and that you have to um, pass it again into this signal um, at the end. And for example, you cannot, um, you cannot use, um, signals are, are um, over, continuous over time. So you cannot use a value and use it to create a new signal directly because you cannot directly somewhere in the time um, create a new signal and you also cannot create uh, uh, with the changing value signals because then you would have a lot of changing signals and I think this part is hard to understand. I think the notation for example is maybe not so hard but it uses this a bit cryptic symbols which are common in, in Haskell. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I have to find uh, a way how beginners can easily use this function without learning much about Haskell, but that's maybe really hard. <laughs> yeah. So the question was if I um, had a look at the approach to compile Haskell into VHDL and control hardware this way. I found a Clash, which is a language that allows you to write Haskell programs and it will translate them to VHDL. Um, but I didn't uh, look at this approach. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't want to take too long. Uh, Alehouse is waiting. But I just thought that I'd uh, share something small with you people since it's just, I just got to know of it today. So j this just came out today. And I thought that oh, this evening we have the Haskellers meet up and maybe some of you may be interested in giving it for a, giving it, uh, taking it for a ride. So um, I guess all of us love uh, Haskell and one of the nice things about Haskell is its types and you can use its types uh, to search in APIs for this. Yeah? Uh, most of us don't use Haskell in our day jobs. Uh, and some people say that, hey, if I only had Google for Java, this would be great. Okay, uh, I have another master's student who took this as a topic, and this is the first prototype of what we have. So it's, uh, it's type-directed search, like Google, but it's for Java. So at the moment, we're making it a bit generic so that you can use it for Java and TypeScript, those are the two prototype languages that we have. But in general, under the hood, we have a, a system of uh, F, uh, F plus with uh, subtyping, something like that, and that sort of translates the stuff out. So anyway, so let's try this out a little bit. And uh, I want to find, let's say I want to find map in Java. So what do I do? I would say I need something of type um, stream. New keyboard, stream. Let's try this. Way map, nice. Okay, okay, so good. So this this sort of works. It's the first prototype. We've been working on it. Um, play with it. Um, the link is up here. So uh, it's everything till till here. Uh, 
elewyth.gitlab.io slash type minus search. And uh, yeah, in case you have any feedback, feel free to send it to me or use these uh, feedback buttons there. We're collecting some statistics to improve it. And uh, yeah, that's what's, what's going to happen. Thank you very much.